In John chapter 10, uh, verse 10, Jesus makes a remarkable statement. The thief comes only to kill and to destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it abundantly. These are the questions that I would like for us to consider. Would you say that you were living an abundant life? And I wonder if posing questions like that makes us uncomfortable. Are you ever quiet enough? Do you ever pause long enough to ask yourself a question like that? And if you did, how would you find the answer? What does abundant living look like in our culture and in your life? What kinds of things would keep us from living abundantly? Obviously, I have no time to answer those questions. And quite frankly, it isn't my job to answer those questions. It's your job. If you have the courage to ask and to investigate. In the first chapter of Mark, Mark says that after Jesus was baptized by John and the Holy Spirit had descended upon him, Mark says the Holy Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness for 40 days. The Holy Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness for 40 days. So why do you suppose the Spirit did that? We know about the temptation. But the temptation didn't take 40 days. So what was Jesus doing the rest of the time? There was no fast food. There was no TV to watch movies or sports on. He didn't have an iPhone to play games on. No iPad to send and receive emails. No iPod to listen to music on. No internet to access the surf and access the net and get the latest news. So what did he do for 40 days? Do you have any idea how long 40 days is with no entertainment? and no distractions? I want to suggest to you that Jesus figured out who he was and what his purpose in life was. The very next verse after Jesus comes back from the wilderness says, he came to Galilee proclaiming the good news, saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Jesus comes back from the wilderness, brothers and sisters, transformed. He comes back energized. He knows who he is, and he knows what his purpose is in life. And that is what drives him for the rest of his life. Every decision that Jesus makes from this point on is made in the light of who he is and what his purpose in life is. If we look back at Mark, verse 4, Mark says, So John came, baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. Now John wore clothing made out of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist 
and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was John's message. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. We know that John the Baptist was full of the Holy Spirit. So what do we learn from these passages about the transforming power of the Spirit in John the Baptist's life? Does that mean that we should all start dressing in a peculiar fashion and start eating weird stuff? I know a lot of people who are already doing that. I believe that the transforming power of the Spirit is evidenced in the fact that John knows who he is and he knows what his purpose in life is. And he dedicated himself, he set himself apart, which is what holiness is, to that purpose for as long as he lived. No, John's dedication to what he knew his purpose in life was is evidence of the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. He knows who he is, he knows what his purpose is, and he spends the rest of his life doing that thing. I believe that God intended that the transforming power of the Holy Spirit would do the same thing in every child of God in every generation. The Holy Spirit is is here to help us to discover who we are and what our purpose in life is. In John chapter 3, verse 1, Jesus says to Nicodemus, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of the water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. And we get some insight into what it means to be baptized in the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. But it's important, I think, to see that the transforming power of the Holy Spirit evidenced in Acts chapter 2 is not confined to the speaking in tongues phenomenon. It is evidenced in the transformed new lives of those who were born from above. Those of us who are living 2,000 years later may wonder if that transforming power is still available. And if it is, how should that impact our lives? And I would at least give you this idea. The transforming power in Acts chapter 2 I believe is more evident, it is more relevant to us in the fact that a middle-aged, totally uneducated fisherman who had never done anything like this before in his life stood up and addressed an audience of thousands in a bold and eloquent way and convicted them of the things that they had just done and they were immersed and transformed and entered into a new life. This is the type of transformation that the power of the Holy Spirit was intended to produce in us. It brings the abundant life that enables us to lead a new and transformed life in the midst of a culture that has completely lost its moral compass. Being born of the Spirit, church, means to be made spiritually alive. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. The evidence of the transforming power of the Holy Spirit in us is when he begins the process of freeing us from the tyranny of self-interest. 
Now, I want to say that again. If you want to know if you're a living and abundant life, a transformed life, one of the evidences, one of the big important evidences of that is, is the Holy Spirit processing you in the direction of freeing yourself from the tyranny of self-interest. We can never live a new abundant life until we stop acting like it's all about me. As we enter a new year, may God help us to realize that this new abundant life can never be realized until we learn that. It's not about me. Another evidence of abundant life I wish I had more time for this, but I want to I want to at least attempt to challenge you to think about abundant life creates a feeling of confinement in us. It creates a hunger for largeness, a yearning for more room room to go higher up and deeper in. There is also a hunger for a deeper and purer kind of love, a love that is totally unselfish, a love that frees us from wanting anything from the one we love but the freedom to go on loving them. In baptism, We emphasize the importance of the forgiveness of sins, and we should. But forgiveness is not the goal of Christianity. Forgiveness is the means to the goal. The goal is holiness. The goal is sanctification. The goal is a new and transformed life in Jesus Christ. The challenge for us today is to leave this building filled with a passion for life. Not not this physical life, but that new, abundant, transformed life that tells us who we are and what our purpose in life is. It is that new life that gets more and more alive as it gets closer to the source of its life. There is a whole world outside of this building waiting to see the people of God living a passionate, courageous, victorious, joyful, transformed, and overcoming new abundant life by the power of the Holy Spirit. These really are the days of Elijah. The fields really are white unto the harvest. This really is the year of Jubilee. And we really are the laborers in God's vineyard. And yes, yes, these really are days of darkness and famine and sword, especially spiritually speaking. And these really are the days when the people of God need to stand up and lift up their voices declaring the word of the Lord. And that's what we're going to do right now. We're going to stand up. No, 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 get get up. Now we're going to sing about the days of Elijah. And then we're going to go out in the world and we're going to declare the word of the Lord. And this whole standing congregation said, thank you. And these are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord.